Hey, yo. What's up, man? What's happening? It's early. It is early. It is <laughs> 7 a.m. on a Sunday, and I'm buzzing to be here. Mm. Coffee's good. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> Coffee's always good. Oh, that's all right. We, 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 you and me, we, we used to wake up early anyway. Yeah, I don't sleep that much. Man, that's it. What's that? Sleep? Yeah. That's no time. It. That's it. <laughs> you sleep when you're dead, mate. <laughs> 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 Which might not be that long. Oh, yeah, true. <laughs> Man, the way you work yourself. Yeah, yeah. definitely. <laughs> All right. So, welcome back, boys and girls. Um, we do have a guest online, and that's the reason why we're up early on a Sunday. Because it's worth it. It is. It's very worth it. So, he's a strength and conditioning expert that likes to focus mainly on Muay Thai. He has two podcasts. Um, one, he picks uh, heavy hitters and the science of building champions. Really enjoy that podcast. Um, it is Don Heatrief of the UK. How are you today, sir? I'm fine, thank you. And I really appreciate you getting up early so I'm not having to stay up too late and I'm half asleep for you. <laughs> well, we, we appreciate you coming on. So, like you said, <laughs> uh, like we said, we're up anyway. So, yeah. So, uh, <laughs> <laughs> so Don, um, when we first have one, someone that's new to the podcast here, uh, we'd just like to know everything about you. So um, can you tell us about your background, like in like martial arts or sports that you started with and how you got into um, Muay Thai in particular? Yeah. So actually you're saying that kind of, where did I start with martial arts? That's made me rewind quite a way. And I hadn't, it's almost like I blocked this out of my memory, but I was about seven or eight, I think it was when I, I actually started judo. And that's, that's kind of a, a portion of my, my kind of, uh, my transition, if you like, that I'd completely lost because I only did it for like a couple of gradings. I started off, I was in a group with lots of other kids my, my age. And then um, after a couple of gradings, I was the only one left of my age group. They'd all kind of disappeared. And I was left with all the more experienced and much bigger kids. And they wouldn't let me throw me, they wouldn't let me throw them anymore. So it was, uh, that wasn't fun anymore. And I just kind of fell out of love with that and I, I wasn't progressing. So I stopped. Um, but my next kind of transition after that, I guess, was from I was about the age of 10 or 11, I think it was. I got into American football, which in the UK is quite unusual, but it was the mid 80s and it had kind of come on Channel 4 and it was like, whoa, this looks fun. You know, it was full contact. This was the kind of stuff I liked. Um, and I got into that and, and I, I, I actually started playing um, competitively as a junior and, and transitioned right through. Didn't actually stop playing until I was 18. Um, but what I really loved about the American football was that there was um, a playbook that you had to learn. There was strategy and tactics. You know, you'd change what you were doing. There were different specialist roles on the team as well. So I got to play running back because I was kind of good at throwing, catching, running, doing all that kind of stuff. So it was quite a, an all-round position. But I I really enjoyed that. And then the uh, the coach that we had for our American football team was a U.S. serviceman. And he got stationed somewhere else. And for a year, the team disbanded. And I was looking for something to do to keep me fit. I've always been into martial arts. You know, I saw Bruce Lee and thought I'd love a bit of that. Um, and it was right around that time as well, I guess. This was early 90s. So uh, in the UK, there was uh, who you saw everywhere in the UK, as far as um, full contact martial arts, it was Master Skin and his student, Sandy Holt. And I saw those guys. and. Also, of course, um, the Van Damme, Jean-Claude Van Damme's film, Kickboxer. And I was cool. like, ah, this looks like the real deal. <laughs> <laughs> that's, that's really what got me, turned my gaze towards Muay Thai. But actually where I lived in, in East Anglia in the UK, there weren't any Muay Thai gyms. It, that was all, Master Skin and all those guys, um, the, the, the kind of founders of UK Muay Thai were up in the north, Manchester. It was uh, Master Toddy and Woody, all those guys were up there. And there was lots of gyms up there, but nothing going on where I was. So I, I, then the closest thing I could get was a full contact kickboxing gym. So I joined there. Um, it was freestyle, taekwondo and, and kickboxing. So I did both those martial arts in parallel and, and never actually went back to, to uh, American football again. And uh, just loved going from, I guess, like a team sport where it was good if everyone was as invested as you were and did their bit and learned the playbook and knew exactly what was going on. But when they didn't, that kind of got me a bit frustrated a bit, especially the position I used to play running back. I'd be the one to get smashed for it. Um, and actually going to a, a solo sport like, uh, like kickboxing at the time as a poor substitute for Muay Thai. Um, I just absolutely loved it and 
and being able to get flexible so I could kick head height and all that kind of stuff. It was, it was ranges of motions I hadn't had before. Um, but it, it took actually until 1995, I think it was. So sort of a good sort of three or four years. So I'd already got my sort of black belt in, um, in kickboxing and a second Dan in, in uh, freestyle Taekwondo as well. And actually then uh, a Muay Thai gym opened up and I was, I was straight there and that was it. No turning back then. Once I, once I saw Muay Thai and really got to do it properly, that, that was the martial art for me. It fitted. Ah, nice. Yeah. It's, I think that's like, like a common story for a lot of people. Like, you know, especially when you grow up, you kind of just thrown into team sports and, um, but like, you know, then you get the people that kind of, become like you know doing muay thai or whatever it's like yeah it's just like the the team sport kind of aspect of almost like you have to rely on other people just in drill it's like you know mm -hmm. when you know when it's just yourself then like you know at least i know i know what i'm doing i can train myself i can train myself i know I, like i can be accountable for everything and then like it, then it's on you yeah that's it that's mm -hmm. it and it would say it wasn't it was actually while i was on my engineering studies that i transitioned over to, to Muay Thai. So at that time I was still kind of in parallel. I was kind of American football, um, started an engineering career, doing my studies there. And it was actually one of my, one of my uh, mates on my course that said, you know, come and do Kashinkai karate. And actually that, I just remembered that's, that was something I actually started with first, um, a good solid art. If you've come across that one, Kyokushin, um, but no, no punches to the head. And that was where I went. I need, uh, that was when I did my research and saw, you know, Muay Thai, and it's like, yep, yeah, this this is the way to go. Yeah. And it was actually then in 2000 that I ended up being a, like a Muay Thai instructor as well and uh, had that urge to compete, though, because where I was, no one was competing. Mm. Ah, okay. But, uh, yeah, how do you, um, yeah, so when did you start competing then? And like, yeah, and like how long did you compete for in Muay Thai? Yeah, so I didn't, I didn't actually start competing just because it was really weird because the, the guy who was, um, teaching Muay Thai. He was a martial artist who did Muay Thai as one of the disciplines. It was that it was more of a martial arts academy, you know, and that was that was the setup. Um, as I guess it, it kind of tended to be sort of back in that that sort of earlier time, especially in the UK. Um, but there, there weren't any fighters. So it was the the martial art of Muay Thai, if you like. So I was doing all of that, um, constantly had this like the Muay Thai is a ring sport. I want to fight. I want to compete. But the 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 coach he just wasn't wasn't interested in that his his kind of experience from sort of freestyle uh, karate that he was doing as well was that people would compete they would lose lose interest and he'd lose students so he wasn't interested yeah. in pushing anyone to fight um i kind of couldn't let that go i was getting older um you know i sort of that sort of 30 to 34 age group there and i'm thinking i still haven't other than the odd very sporadic as we call them into clubs here in the uk and non-decision fight very very sporadic where every time i had one it was like i'm starting again you know there was no no momentum to any of that um and i was already teaching for this guy the muay thai classes and uh you know i said i said to my instructor you know i really need to fight for and the window is closing here on age i'm not gonna be able to fight and i need to do it and he said well okay um if you want to fight then you're going to have to sort it out yourself. I can't corner for you to sort any of that out. And if anyone else wants to fight, you're going to have to coach them and sort them out as well. And I was kind of like, well, if it's the only way I'm going to get to do it, that's what I did. So, um, yeah, I was about 32, 33 years old, I guess. Um, been training in Muay Thai a long, long time and teaching it, but feeling a bit of a fraud because I'd never actually done the comp competition side of it um, and had no experience of, you know, ring craft. We were training on mats. You know, I had no cornering was like no clue. So literally just had to sort of rock up on the, on the amateur scene here in, in the UK. I was actually in Tottenham in London and just started, um, actually kind of a crash test. I mean, I did pretty well, uh, just kind of learning as I went along. I just had some of, some of my training buddies really cornering, cornering for me. And we're just watching what everyone else was doing, trying to figure out how to do it. And, um, after a, it, in my first year there, I actually did really really well and I, I managed to win three different um area titles at different weights just experimenting with my weight as well i kind of i'm a bit of an analytical kind of person with this the engineering side and i was always like well what's my most competitive weight you know so i was i went up in weight down in weight i had this sort of nice goldilocks and the three bears the nice middle weight you know um 
and I, and I managed to get selected for the for the national team and go off to fight in Bangkok at the, at the World Championships. And that was when I learned how to fight, where I how, learned how to coach fighters, to corner fighters. And I, I got to, to fight on that. And it was I was um, I, because I didn't have a coach. The weird thing was they normally you bring a coach along with you um, mm -hmm. and the 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 national team, they said, you can you can pick any one of the coaches to, to help you out because you're a bit of an anomaly. You haven't got anyone. And I picked the guy who'd seen me fight the most in, in the Tottenham gym then there, a guy called Vinny Decon. And um, he is absolutely awesome. I've got so much respect for that guy. And I, I learned in, the, in the, the, the couple of weeks I was there for that competition so much from him. And it just completely changed what I did. And when I came back, I was, I was fighting, I was coaching everybody. And it was like confidence now. And when you say um, at the World Championship, the championships there was kind of where you learned to coach and learn to fight, was a, a big part of that just being in that kind of just melting pot of how all of the kind of elite countries do it? Was it being able to be there and observe how kind of, you know, Team Russia, Team Thailand, Team, you know, and so on and so on, just watching how they did things, was that a big influence on how you then went home and started to apply things? Yeah, I think that was the interesting thing because, I mean, even, even in the national team, that, that I was in, the different coaches were doing different things. Um, and where we were there in, in national stadium in, in Thailand, in Bangkok, everybody's just out on the floor and you just kind of called into the center to fight. So all the teams are just warming up around each other. So you, there's just lots of watching and going, oh, yeah, like you say, like the Russians are doing this or, mm. you know, the, the French are doing this, the Japanese guys are doing this. And then I'm even watching the different guys from, from England and they're, they're doing different things. And you just end up kind of cherry picking the bits that work best for you. And the, the guy that was helping me out, Vinny Decon, was really good in that he was, he was saying, you know, it, it was a, a knockout competition. So as soon as you lost, you're out. I managed to to get three fights actually, so that was I just stopped short of the of the medal. I um, I'll quick I'll just explain that bit. So I I drew in my third fight, um, the defending two times world champion from Russia, and I got a split decision loss to him. Um, and if I'd have won that, I'd have got a medal. So I kind of came out of that having learned loads, but just felt like I was so close to medal. So that that was that was kind of that's always been in my head that one at the world championships, but. Um, yeah, it was it was just getting to fight those different people, the the different styles, um, seeing how they warmed up, um, what the corner teams were doing, all this kind of stuff was was very very different and something I'd just not been exposed to personally. You know, I literally had just before this, I just turned up with my buddies from the gym, my sparring partners, and you know, I even had instances where um, <laughs> at the gym in Tottenham they had a almost like a spittoon bucket hanging on the corner of the ring. It was one of you know it's a real down and dirty gym. The canvas was all just blood stained and torn and everything. There's this bucket of effectively bleach hanging uh, from the corner post, and my my corner team actually took my gum shield out between rounds and dropped it in the bleach, and that that was the kind of <laughs> that is weird. And I put this gum shield back in, and it was I don't know if you've ever had bleach in your mouth, but it burns. <laughs> I, I can imagine. I'm probably not going to try it. I think it's written on the bottle. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, yeah. <laughs> do not do this. But the, yeah, the um, the the, uh, the referee stopped the fight and said, right, yeah, you know, time, time, right. And he said, what the hell's going on here? Because I was just like, oh. <laughs> and we explained what happened. He goes, that he goes, that's hilarious. I've never had to stop a fight for that before. But that was that was where I was coming from. So I had a big learning curve um, when I when I went to the World Championships, and it was just all this stuff was just soaking up. <laughs> that's an amazing story. Uh, yeah. That's <laughs> <laughs> maybe, maybe that's one of those we can look back and laugh situations because i can't imagine that was particularly funny at the time oh, no it wasn't and and my the poor lads that were helping me out they were mortified <laughs> luckily I, I still won the fight so that was okay but it was not not fun yeah <laughs> just you did say uh, across telling stories you said a couple of things that i find quite interesting that i'd like to get your take on because to pull it back to when you got your start in that kind of american football you mentioned one of the things um that you liked about it and this could possibly be tied to a background in engineering is you liked that there was a playbook you know there was a set and structured kind of way to learn things this is what there, there was a criteria of learning and then you, you mentioned as well, a big part of um, kind of your development in Muay Thai was to be able to see the way that it was so regimented from other teams, other successful nations at the world championships. And then even within um, 
uh, your own team, things were getting done differently person to person. So as a part of that learning for you, understanding that there had to be a structured framework for developing within tire boxing, was that something that that kind of put together for you? Do you think those, you know, the, the understanding of like that, that the appeal of kind of having a playbook for the sport in football and then being able to watch how things work from other nations, were, were they things that kind of tied together for you? Yeah. I mean, because everything I'd been doing in parallel as well, because I, I, at the same time I was then training in Muay Thai and competing and do all that kind of stuff as well. I was an, an engineering student, um, ended up be basically becoming a, a mechanical design engineer. That's what I was doing. So lots of structure and logical progression and very scientific, I guess. And, um, married that up with the, the supplemental training that we were doing in Muay Thai. So it wasn't just about that's right. In, um, in American football, it wasn't just about game practice. There, there was aerobic conditioning drills that we'd do. There was resistance work in the gym, all this stuff was going on and that would make us better athletes so that we could perform better. So I was kind of immersed in that at the same time. And I saw the structure in all of that. Um, and then going to Muay Thai, that was one of the bits I was like, you know, no one's, no one's using athletic training to help them at, with Muay Thai. That was, that was this, this, is untapped potential that I know you can develop. Um, and, and I guess just having that sort of structured logical approach with what I was doing as a design engineer in that there is a, there is a design specification that dictates mm -hmm. what is a successful product. You're working to, to build that anything that's superfluous to that. We don't bother with, we don't need it. If it's down in the spec, this is what we're working to. And I just had that kind of approach to everything that I did. And it was, it was a case then of just picking the bits that I could see were successful and dropping the bits that weren't. And, but also being aware, especially when you see, you know, different gyms doing different things and different fighters doing different things, even from the same gym it is then personalizing it to make it work for that individual as well. And that was the bit that I thought, you know, so it's not like there's a structured ap approach and it's absolutely universal for everybody. It definitely isn't. Um, and I, and I found that, you know, stuff that, I experimented with even in those um, three fights that I had at the world championships, each preparation was better than the last one because we dropped some of the stuff that didn't work for me and did more of the stuff that did work. I, I looked at, you know, even how long before I thought I was going to fight because you never know someone might get stopped in the fight before you and you're out there early, but how, how long did I need to, to warm up? Um, what, what felt too short and I felt like I was rushing. I didn't get enough time and what felt like of, I've overcooked this now. I've, I, I peaked a good sort of 15, 20 minutes ago, and now I'm starting to flag again a bit and, and just getting that timing right, you know, and it's, that's all personal. And, uh, that, that kind of structured approach, I guess, comes from really that, that discipline that I had as an engineer, as well as the experience I had with other, other sports before Muay Thai. Nice. So going from that, let's go into like what, what you're mainly known for nowadays is like, you know, basically it's all the strength conditioning work you're doing for Muay Thai. But um, how did you get into the, the profession of being a strength and conditioning coach? Yeah, so th this is a bit of a weird one. So I'd, I'd been actually teaching Muay Thai in parallel to being an engineer just as a part time thing in the evening. So I'd, I'd actually been running my own my own club for quite a while and having successful fighters since I would came back and done everything I'd done as a fighter myself. And, um, I just got to a point where I'd, I'd been then a mechanical design engineer for, for 18 years. And I was just constantly, you know, every lunchtime at work, I was just planning what I was doing in the evening with the fighters and was looking at what we're going to do to optimize their training. And I was just getting, so, do you know, what? I just want to do this full time. You know, I've, I've got to have the uh, conversation with my wife now that actually I'd like to jack in this career that's a nice, stable, relatively well-paid career. And I'd like to be a full-time Muay Thai coach and, and do everything that I think can help fighters because they're all doing their gym stuff as well. Just even, at, um, you know, local sports centers and they haven't got the equipment they, they really need. And we're having to start kind of work around things. It's all, you know, resistance machines rather than free weights. And, you know, we haven't got the athletic training gear. And I just thought, you know, I'm going to set my own gym up properly as an athletic to, uh, athlete's gym. And it's a combined Muay Thai and strength and conditioning gym. We're going to do this right. So as often happens in the UK, there was like waves of redundancies come around. And I'd seen lots of them in the 18 years I'd been at the, this company since a, a trainee. And um, 
I was very lucky actually my my boss at the time I approached him and I said that you know I know you don't want to get rid of me but I'd like to volunteer for redundancy because the redundancy money would really help me set up what I want to do next um and he was kind of looking at me like going what you want to do what and I just said well you know I'd, I'd love to be made redundant so I've got that redundancy money but I said you know in all reality my heart is set on this now and he, he could see that in me you know I said within a year I'll be doing this anyway um but I'd, I'd love to go now with a bit of money to invest in my retraining properly to get all the sports science and strength and conditioning side done as well and um that's what happened he kind of uh, reluctantly let me go and yeah that was sort of 2008 so that was literally a year after I'd fought at the world championships to see it all kind of turned around. And really since 2008, I've been a, a full-time, um, well, Muay Thai and, and strength and conditioning coach, but I've kind of sh shifted the emphasis a little bit now, rather than just sort of saying strength and conditioning. Cause I've, I'm refer to it more as like uh, Muay Thai performance really, because mm -hmm. strength and conditioning is one of the tools we use. It's a major one that I think everyone's missing out on, but there's so much that in terms of like sports science that, um, actually makes a fighter better um, yeah. so that, that's i'm kind of interested in anything that improves muay thai performance so i go off and research that and try and figure out how to practically apply it properly and do some tests and then roll it out to try and help as many people with it as i can so you mentioned like off of kind of negotiating that redundancy and, and a big part of that was having the means to invest in your development in your ability to kind of do the necessary research to to fulfill for, to fill this role that, that you wanted to what kind of um what did you undertake to kind of gain that that sort of knowledge was it a particular um certification like once you had sort of moved off from your engineering role what were the first pieces of kind of study or, or development that you sought out well the first one i did was just a regular kind of what we call here in the, in the uk a level three qualification which was um personal training yep. so that's more kind of health and fitness everyone's kind of familiar with that i did that first very quickly realized once i got through the course despite what it looked like in the in the module listings like this isn't very good for sports performance <laughs> to be honest despite what they said very similar. <laughs> and then and then i i looked at strength and conditioning specifically and i got a, a level three qualification in that and then studied to do a level four one in that and uh, that kind of brought everything together now it sort of took that the, the theoretical sports science, if you like, and and gave it that practical application to actually make an athlete better and to make an athlete better at a specific sport that they've got. Um, and my absolute passion being Muay Thai was all I was ever thinking about in terms of application. Whenever I'm learning something is how does this apply to Muay Thai? How can this make better fighters? And that's that's kind of the route I took. Right. Yeah. And it's like, um, it's really taken off. I've, I've, I've followed your stuff for a long time and kind of implemented a lot of your stuff as well. It's good. Like, yeah, same thing. Cause I, I've been doing strength coaching now for like 10, 12 years, and, but I love the field cause it's always changing. Like I take a lot of like, um, yeah, knowledge and like inspiration from you. Um, also like from people like Phil Daru as well, like, you know, just in that kind of like yeah. that martial arts kind of realm. And it's like, and it's really taken off. Like, you know, basically when I was first started from there, it's like, you know, it's like it's either two things. You got a you got a bodybuilding split, or you got a powerlifting split. From that one, you got and you just got to build it. Yeah. <laughs> Which is like now, it's like people with, like you guys from there. It's like it's it's yeah. You use some of those elements, but you got to use it in a way that's like catered to each athlete and what they need to be. Then they need more, more strength. Then they need more like speed training or just mobility in general. Um. So. Yeah. Going from that, like with your experience so far of Muay Thai, is there a lot, like a lot of common, like a common uh, set of deficiencies that you find in people that do Muay Thai in particular that they, that you usually um, first work upon? So it, is that for someone who's literally purely just doing Muay Thai or is doing some other supplemental training as well? Let's just say they're just doing just Muay Thai. Yeah. Just Muay Thai. Yeah. So it, it tends to be that there's um, far too much upper body pushing going on in terms of the patterns so there's not enough rowing and pulling going on so there, there tends to be that sort of lack of balance to what they're doing there um but it's 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 also the the kind of lack of lower body training i guess it tends to be sort of like push-ups for strength and uh, other than sort of running and kicks there's not a lot of lower body proper strength training going on so when you actually even you know i've been out to thailand to test some of the fighters there you they think they're strong um but when you actually test them 
in a scientific term of what pure strength would be the force production bit they're not they're not at all they're just efficient at applying this the smaller relatively small amount of strength they've got they haven't sort of boosted that up so most fighters i find particularly with the lower body aren't very strong at all and uh, that's that's pretty deficient and then other than that it tends to be you talk about sort of mobility but more sort of posture so there's, there's more of that sort of tight shortening on the front of the of the shoulders and sort of lengthening and weakening of the back and that sort of that structural integrity needs to be improved um that that tends to be the key bits i go to initially other than then you know it's it's personal as to what each person's got yeah it's i i guess like yeah like it's like any sport um really like the, the first basis when you get someone like that that doesn't really do any kind of supplement training strength or whatever kind of wise from there it's really just it's kind of like, yeah, fixing the balance of the body. Like, you know, just the, because whatever sport you're going to do, you're going to overuse that area. And then most of the time it's not ideal for you <laughs> for, for posture wise <laughs> and that, and like, you know, just fixing That's that up, right. like, you can really just improve their performance in general. Yeah. Yeah. And it's, it's one of those ones that I, I, I mean, that that typical upper body posture that I mentioned about being sort of tight and short on the front is just really that belief that, you know, if I'm if I'm doing lots of push-ups or, or bench press, if I am doing some some weight training as well, that's going to help me punch. Um, without that kind of understanding that muscles work in in groups, in pairs, in opposite sides of the joint. So you know, agonist and antagonist. That's the name of the groups there. But everyone trains the the agonist on the front there to push, but unless you're strong on the antagonist, the muscles that are the brakes then your body doesn't let you have all of the, the explosive power that you've got from the front because it doesn't trust the brakes, you know? So it's, that's one I sort of try and tell people, you know, if you want to punch harder, actually work your pull as well, because you, if your body doesn't trust you to stabilize your shoulder joint in general and your scapula at the back, if it's all just going to kind of lose integrity. Your body won't let you apply all the power you've got. I so, said, you know, it's, it's kind of like um, having a high performance sports car with really bad brakes. You're not going to be going flying into a corner particularly quick. And that's, Whereas you've got great breaks, you can go flying into that corner break uh, quickly. So it's keep keep the balance, and your performance goes up anyway. Mm -hmm. Yeah. So like we we're talking about before, before this, like um, so like when you like uh, when you first gone into the scene from there, was was there a lot of resistance met with in terms of like doing state strength and conditioning? Because like I remember like like when I was fighting from this, like you do a little bit of weights, but like you don't want to do too much, you know, to make it too slow. You know, you see the big bodybuilders, they don't move around too quick. You don't want to be like that. Um, yeah. Did you get a similar kind of vibe when you first start trying to implement this stuff? Well, that's what I was expecting. I mean, it was kind of early days, I guess. It was kind of 2011, 2012, I think, when I first started putting anything online. So at that stage, anyone who was doing anything decent in, in Muay Thai, they were pretty much just using the the Thailand model. You know, they were people that were managing to to go to Thailand, spend extensive time there, come back and mimic what the Thais were doing back in their native country as well. Um, there wasn't really any strength and condition, you know, strength work going on, other than you know the uh, holding um, some some sort of weight in your teeth and lifting up with a towel, you know, all that kind of stuff. That that was it, and it was all body weight stuff pull-ups or chin-ups were kind of like the most that was going on really other than that it, it was running um so it, it was at that stage where i'd been implementing for quite some time with the people i've been training and myself extensively resistance training that didn't make people big and bulky and slow that actually just made them stronger and more explosive and then lots of energy systems conditioning work as well with that so they can apply that strength and that power relentlessly for longer and all this kind of stuff, because we were targeting these, these developments. And I was like keen to just thinking, you know, come on Muay Thai community. We need to use all the tools that are available to us, not just following one thing. There's lots of good stuff that's going on there, but there's a whole chunk that's missing. Um, and if we bring that in, we can just kind of raise the level of the game for everybody. Cause every, you know, that rising tide lifts all boats, that kind of attitude. And I just thought, oh, I just wish, we could kind of get get that properly looked into, properly explored, without just kind of shooting it down because it's not the traditional Thai way. Um, and so when I first started putting a few articles out, sort of 2011, 2012, I was expecting everyone saying, "What are you talking about? The Thais don't train like this." And um, I was expecting to really kind of have a rough time of it, but it didn't happen. 
I, I don't know if people just ignored it or I guess there wasn't much of a platform. So perhaps not many people heard about it anyway. Um, but what the, the feedback I did get is people just asking questions, mm. asking questions. I want to know a bit more about this and a bit more about that. I was like, Oh, I wasn't actually expecting this. I kind of, um, it was a tentative. I'm going to put some of this stuff out and they just share what I'm doing and um, not really trying to influence anyone, but just sharing some ideas and hopefully some open-minded people will look at it. But people were starting to ask questions and I was kind of, um, I guess what it's always kind of happened to me, I've reluctantly been pushed to the front. We'll, we'll talk about this and show it. And it, that's always been uh, throughout, you know, being, being a Muay Thai coach, I didn't, I just wanted to be a fighter, but I ended up coaching because I got asked to do it and ended up doing it. Um, when I was working as an engineer, I ended up um, the research and development supervisor and then leading up a team of designers. And it was kind of like, I didn't want to lead teams up. I just wanted to do my thing, but I just kind of always got, ended up pushed up to the front is kind of personality trait. I'm not I'm kind of reluctant to it, but will embrace it. So um, that's kind of happened again with this. So I'm, I'm really privileged really to now, to now have something that's working online as well. And that was, that was something that I wanted to develop because I've having been someone who's um, studied Muay Thai in a region that didn't have a lot of Muay Thai and, you know, with the internet, the way it is now, you can kind of tap into a lot more, a lot more influences and, and good level influences. I was keen to kind of like, I can't get around and do seminars in different places and all these different gyms with, with all this sort of performance science and strength and conditioning stuff, but online, I can really reach those people that are passionate about it as well and open-minded. So, um, yeah, there's been a really nice kind of very slow trickle, if you like, I guess, where, uh, people are getting more from the Muay Thai community are get, becoming more open-minded to it. Um, and I think actually these days, the, the one championship is showcasing lots of different, um, supplemental training as well. And I think that's, that's making the Muay Thai community kind of take a bit of a closer look as well. And perhaps thinking, oh, perhaps it's not all just full of crap, this stuff. <laughs> and do, do you think like one thing I'm always um, really interested in is this idea that like here in Western countries, we can't just directly follow a Thailand model. Like it is very easy to go. Like I think going, like I say all fighters should spend time in Thailand. I think, uh, it's just so enriching in the way that just, I mean, like if I, I, there's just the cultural side of it. Like you're doing the sport of Muay Thai. I think it helps you to go and see it at its kind of birthplace. Um, but also just to experience, like when you can go and clinch with a high level Thai and work with a high level Thai trainer, it just, there is so much that is eye opening. And I think it's very easy to come home. Everyone comes home from Thailand, super inspired. You know, they go and they work hard and they push their limits a lot and they go, yeah, I can, I can really apply this. And then I think the common reaction so much of the time is, okay, now I have spent time in a place where everyone is so good, good at Muay Thai that I have to just do exactly what they're doing here at home. Do you think one of the things that's misunderstood is that simply you are never going to be in the same situation as these Thai fighters? So yes, they do it the way that they do it and they run 20 kilometers a day and you know this and that but also they've worked on their skills from the age of six for four or five hours a day um, and just got a lot of repetition is that you simply cannot get that same kind of re repetition of the purely technical side of it um, and thus it's going to be very different if you try to copy it as someone who most likely found the sport a little bit earlier doesn't have the same amount of time in the day to train it and will never have the same fight experience do you think um i mean i'm interested just to get your take on that is kind of the issue from someone who's just trying to mimic the thailand style that we can't place ourselves directly in the exact same format that it's it's kind of um not like their day to day is not something that we can get the effects of because it's just so different in application to, to someone in a Western country's life. Is, is that what you sort of find? Yeah. I mean the, the Thai model, if you want to call it that of training is it works, you know, it does work to produce world-class fighters and best in the world. The, the thing is just like you say, it takes a lot of time, a lot of repetition. Um, the, there are seemingly so, powerful because they're super efficient at what they do because of the thousands and thousands and thousands of repetitions that they've performed. So they, they can actually um, deliver those strikes in a relaxed way because the coordination of it is so embedded and entrenched. None of those 
antagonist muscles, the brakes are on when they're accelerating, you know, whereas anybody else that hasn't had that number of repetitions and that sort of motor pattern efficiency is a bit more tight as they're throwing it. So, you know, that's, that's why they're so fluid. They're, of course, their technical and tactical eye is just so good with the, the visual incoming strikes and they know what's coming. They, they, they can anticipate things a lot better as well. That they have all the running in there. It builds that aerobic base, but also because of the volume of training they've got, they need to work on recovery. And actually, because it's a slow, steady run, that that's what that serves. Yeah. It, it keeps the aerobic capacity, but it's more of a restorative thing. It gets oxygenated blood around their body so that they can train again. So all of the the, the high number of hours that they're they're training, they're they're kind of working a nice balance on that. What then what they're not doing is bringing in strength work and and really true conditioning work they're not optimizing that either so they're just um working the technical and tactical working uh uh restorative work as well as once they've built the aerobic base that's not really serving much for purpose other than than restoring them but that takes a lot of hours like you say to become um good doing it that way in terms of technically and tactically perfect in terms of like the athletic athletic conditioning and i always look at it you know it's almost like um your, your body and the athlete itself is kind of like the, the racing car. And then the, the technical and tactical fighter is the driver in the car. And we, there's no reason why we shouldn't almost see that as a little bit independent and say, okay, you can drill that technical and tactical side, but if you've not got the highest performance car as well, why not? Why not upgrade your car to have the best car in the race as well as be the best driver? And if, you know, if the, the tires are kind of working on a huge fuel capacity tank and, uh, but they've, they've got no real raw power and speed in there and they're just really super efficient at what they do. What would happen if the tires actually twig this and managed to get structured strength and power training going on as well? It would boost them right up at the moment. It's just, it's not something they do. They, it's not something traditionally they do. So that's going to be something tricky to implement because of the the culture in Muay Thai or in Thailand generally where you respect the elders and you know that there's tradition and this is the way we've been shown this is the way we do it and and I guess a little less open-minded to to new things especially something like sports science that then a lot of the Thais haven't especially fighters in the camps haven't experienced so they've, they've got no no model to go from on that and seeing how that works and that financially you need to invest in all this equipment and you know it's like pfft, We'll stick to what we do you know that it works why not that works like i say if you can throw lots of hours at it so i kind of look at it almost like this um you know the Pareto rule the 80 20 rule is kind of like if if you can focus your 20 percent of your time on the right things it makes 80 percent of the difference so i'm constantly looking at what things can we slot into that 20 percent time to get you the best progress and actually a lot of what the ties do are outside of that 20%. So it's a, it's in terms of the strictest terms, it's kind of a little bit more filler. It, it adds to it, but the, the return on your investment for that time isn't as great as if you started to just put in one or two strength training sessions in the week, you know, proper ones where you're, you're not simulating Muay Thai and trying to have fatigue, where you're actually training something different to bring something else different to the party, build a different aspect on your race car. Um, so that's the way really Westerners that haven't got all these hours and perhaps have got jobs in, in parallel because Muay Thai doesn't pay great. Yeah. Um, we, we've got to be efficient. We need to look at what should our 20% be and, and not try and just mimic the, the, the training model of someone who's got all the hours in the day, basically. And it does work, but it takes another analogy I've got is kind of um, trying to pick up targets with a, with a gun. It's, it's, the time model, I, I see it as more like you're spraying the target with a machine gun, bam, 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 bam. you know, lots of time, lots of ammunition being spent, whereas you could be more like a sniper and pick mm-hmm. your shots a bit more and just invest less ammunition, less time in it and, and still get a, a really good return on, on investment. Another thing that I'm interested to get um, your take on is because the last time I was in Thailand, so because I think a lot of this mentality of just do as the tires do comes from, you know, say trainers that a few years ago, you know, when they were kind of in the developing stage of their time as fighters, they spent time in Thailand. So, so their window in is now quite sort of old fashioned. And I think it also comes from what they do is hard. 
and you know fight training is supposed to be hard it's designed to make and no no of course there's truth to that it's designed to make the fighters tough for being in the ring and i think that can often detract from what's actually you know and they use that you know the mental versus the physical do things that are really hard because it will make you mentally stronger for being in the ring of course there's a place for that but then it's like if you put all the focus on something just being hard like a lot of things are really hard to do that would do no good for your fighting right we could wear a a 50 kilo weight vest and just do burpees for an hour that would be really hard it wouldn't make you very good at muay thai but what i've also seen is i think modern day if you look at kind of the the advanced camps and you mentioned one championship i think this kind of placing tie boxing in that, that more mma style mainstream combat sports format i think when you look at like um say a pechi and d gym a, a pk Senchai gym these gyms that really are at the forefront of that international they're starting to integrate strength and conditioning they're starting to really try to view it and understand it and you watch like especially like um, i think patch morocot patch ND is a really good example uh quite a, a he's a stadium fighter that has really kind of evolved into you know they've changed the way that he trains to to make it more in, internationally focused not just tactically but he's looking bigger and stronger he's filling out his frame i think maybe you know making a little bit more of a weight cut for that that 70 kilos now so i guess do you think like in thailand a lot of their you know, uh, apprehension towards strength and conditioning. It's it, in the past has been lack of access. You know, they didn't have access to the resources to, to, to get the education and things like that. So they just did it the way they knew. Where do you think now we have trainers that, you know, they spent time in Thailand of some years ago and they really try to mimic that. Whereas now we're saying do it like this because that's how they do it in Thailand. But actually, you know, more advanced camps in Thailand are possibly starting to adopt these strength and conditioning. Like it's like, you're kind of, I, I guess, do you think people are like refuting doing training because of how it's done in Thailand when in reality they haven't done it that way because because they haven't had access to, like you kind of have the privilege of access here, but just by that experience in Thailand, you're going, no, I don't, I don't want it. Like, do you, do you think that's kind of a side of it? Do you think that, that Thailand itself is starting to adopt a little bit more modern strength and conditioning? It is, it, but there's obviously a, a, both a financial and a time investment yeah. to do that. So it's why you're only seeing it at certain gyms. Um, but yeah, it absolutely is changing. And it depends which gym, like you say, you go to. A lot of the, the sort of down and dirty grassroots gyms, you're not going to see it there for a, a long time. You know, And they haven't got the, they're not going to invest in the equipment or take the space up in the gym to do that. Or to have someone who knows how to use that equipment as well properly to, to program that kind of training so that it actually makes them better rather than doing all the things they fear it does, making fighters bigger and slower or more tired. You know, that's that's the thing. That's what you've, you're battling against. And I think it's it's part of what actually attracted me to to the strength and conditioning side for for something like Muay Thai is that it's difficult to do because there's so many different qualities you need to be able to mix in a, a successful kind of ratio to make the fighter better. It's not like a sport like um, marathon running where it's pretty simple or sprinters at the other end. We're kind of in the middle. We need to be strong, powerful, fast. We need to be able to go forever. It's technical and tactical as well. It's not just a case of, you know, pulling on some oars as explosively as you can and you're done. There's, there's you know, there's, there's a lot that goes into it. Um, there's no off season when you're programming training, you know, <laughs> you, that you fight quite regularly, especially if you're out in Thailand and how can you still progress your strength and conditioning when you're fighting that regularly and you're constantly in a cycle of fighting and you're not wanting to be too fatigued for that. There's a lot of things to mix and match. And I think, um, you know, for, to actually end up with a strength and conditioning, a strength and conditioning coach effectively, who's capable of doing that. And manage that for different fighters and different stages of the camps it's it's tricky you know and that's that's probably why it's it's going to take a while for it to catch on in in thailand because it's not the easy easiest sport to actually program strength and conditioning for um it's it's why i've really enjoyed getting my teeth into it because it can be done and um, when it is done well it's it's really a game changer for people and not just physically it's psychologically you know when you know you've prepared really well for a fight it makes such a big big difference yeah absolutely and, and i saw last week yeah um a, a good chat between yourself and um i'll probably butcher his last name but paul Benache. um the yes 
on the, the Muay Thai Guys podcast. And, and I, I followed him for a while too. And I noticed he's really making your programming an integral part of his schedule, even as a full-time fighter living in Thailand. Is that something you're doing a bit more of now? Do you find people that are doing the full-time Thailand thing? Are starting to customize a little bit more and find that balance? Like, are you working with a lot of people remotely that, that are out in Thailand full-time? Yes. Yes. I'm doing that. That's, that's increasing. It's difficult because it, it depends on the fight. I mean, Paul's lucky in that he he's got a good relationship with the coaches that he's got at the gym. Um, he's also picked gyms that do have a strength and conditioning element now available to them. Yeah. So they understand that this approach to training. Whereas if you're, if you're, if you're stuck in a really, really traditional Thai gym where the communication isn't that good anyway, they're just going to think you're shirking training, you know, you're not doing what you're being told to do, yep. going to lose interest in you. So it does depend on the fighter and the gym they're at and what sort of relationship they've got. But um, the ones that are at an open-minded gym that do, that do have this equipment um, and can kind of, it's, I mean, I, again, in that conversation with Paul, he, he had instances where he was, he was training when he was injured and he knew he shouldn't have been, but he was just doing it because he knew he'd kind of get shunned by the trainers yeah. if he didn't and ended up with big, big long-term injuries as a result of it. When actually, if he just backed off for like a week or two, he would, he would have been back to a hundred percent. But as it, as it was, it was like years later, he still got the same niggles. Mm -hmm. So there's that communication side of it's really important as well. But yeah, there, there are more and more gyms now that are accommodating of, of at the very least, like a couple of resistance training sessions in the week, which is, which is generally what I, I program for people, but it's then just deciding where in the week that goes, that doesn't, Im that doesn't impact the rest of the training significantly as far as the gym's concerned. Yeah. I, I recall um, one of the times I was in Thailand, some of the guys that were there a bit longer term or full time. I remember the conversations between um, them and the trainers, like, like, cause sometimes it would be interesting because, you know, uh, if, you know, problem number one is if the trainer doesn't speak English, all he can see is that you're not hitting the pads in the morning or you're not doing your knees on the bag in the morning. He doesn't understand that you're doing a program of strength and conditioning. Then if he does speak English, he might understand, but he won't care. You know, like, <laughs> this is what we do in the morning. And I, I remember one of my trips to Thailand, one of the full time, he was, was sitting down with the trainer and he said, two, two morning sessions a week. He said, the morning session is a bit lighter anyway. It's not really the focus session. So two mornings a week. Uh, and he had it printed. Out. He said, I've, I've got a strength to conditioning program. It will make me strong. And the trainer took it and he said, this is going to make you strong. No, like <laughs> the bag, kick the bag, make you strong. Go running makes you strong. And then, um, yeah. you know, he, he was a pretty open-minded trainer. Um, so, uh, his response was, okay, Mr. Scientist, um, see what happens after you get in the ring. So there was like, there was kind of, he was okay with him doing it. It, it does come back to that, you know, up to you um, might, yes. might be the response in the end, but he was, there was already just this kind of rift of like, um, you know, okay, but see what happens when you fight, if you want to go and do your, your, your weights and stuff like that. So I guess it's, yeah, like, like you mentioned that Paul's probably in quite a lucky position. He's at, um, you know, a fairly, a fairly, he's at a fairly new gym actually. Um, and has that little bit of control. Um, is that something that you find there is a little bit of guys want to work? Like, because like, like, if, you, if you're programming for guys, do you ever get back the response? You know, yeah, thanks, but my, my trainers aren't, aren't really on board with this. Yeah. 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 So you, you, you often get that. And it's, it is then just, again, going back to that sort of 80 20 rule. Let's go, okay, we can't have everything we want to do. So out of the work that we did have programmed for you, I'm looking at what's now the game changing 20% of that, that you can just do and just fit that in just to get the best benefit, the, the bits that are going to move you forwards the most. Um, and even if it's, if it's down to something that, I mean, I, I put together a little sub program, which just uses like a TRX suspension trainer for someone who's literally at a gym where there's nothing mm. and we can still train, um, strength, power and speed with that. If you're kind of, if you're programming what you're doing to understand the movement velocities and the exercises so we can still get what we need or um well so at least maintain it but for most people it's still we can really progress them even even with a tool just like that and that can be a very quick little routine that we work just twice a week and that's that's enough to address that side of things if we've, we've not got access to any other equipment or the and the time window is really small 
then we can do that and get away with it. Especially if it's something you could potentially just do in the gym and lash up to the chin up bar they've got and, and get on with a bit, you know, and, and they can actually see you doing the work rather than perhaps going off to some other gym. Yeah. that has got the kit and they're like, Oh, you're training. Are you, we didn't see you. You know, yeah. <laughs> at least if you're using like a TRX there in front of them, they're like, Oh, he's doing something. And uh, they might be quite interested in what you're doing as well. If it's a bit weird and wonderful looking to them. Yeah. Well, that's the part of it as well. So I remember some of the other times I've been in Thailand, I would like, I've been told, uh, two, you know, two morning, you know, the morning sessions in Thailand, a lot of the time, uh, they're a little bit sort of all over the place, like less structured, like a lot of the way, I mean, I guess for people that haven't been there, a lot of the time, the way it works is like the morning session is kind of random. Like you just do a bit less structured. And then the afternoon session, especially if you're in Bangkok, it's basically the same everywhere. It's you, you do your run, you do your pad work, bag work, sparring, clinching, you just do everything. Um, but I would get told Sometimes I'll, I want you to do weights for the morning session two times a week. And I'd say, okay, what do you want me to do? Um, and sometimes I'd say, uh-uh. And, or they just, they just have like, <laughs> that. Yeah, yeah, they have like a couple of plates above it. Like I remember sometimes it was like, all right, this is your, um, I got told by one of the trainers, he's like, this is your weights routine. Essentially, this is how you get strong for punching. And he would say 150 bicep curls. Um, <laughs> that was the majority Why of it. Why does a number? Yeah, no, yeah. <laughs> 150. And then it was just like, just show me all, like they were all in multiples of like, you know, they're all in sets of, yeah, like 100 plus, 100 to 150. Because they do, it's like when you're kneeing the bag or something, they do have that yeah. long form repetition frame of mind and they kind of just apply it to the weight. So it would be like, like they did do exercises that I hadn't even seen before. Like it would be like, I want you to, you know, it would be things like, yeah, I want you to do a hundred bars of curls. And then I want you to take that same bar and put it behind your head and do a hundred kind of military presses. And then I want you to pick it up close and do a hundred kind of pulls and things like that. And it'd be like, it's kind of like, if you want me to do, if, if that's like, I feel like it comes back to that same idea. They are getting into their minds. Like, they want their fighters to be doing strength work. And I think uh, a lot of the camps here, if they get a lot of Westerners through, they understand that this is something that Westerners do. And then they, they realize it sort of makes them stronger, but they, as they wouldn't, they don't have kind of the access to the resources that are required. And then another Thai camp I went to not long ago is they were really into the weights. Like they really like, they were very excited by it. All the fighters really excited, but still like, um, I remember I went to um, one of the bigger camps and they had like a big, sort of TV on the wall that they would play fights on the stuff. And just every fighter had a bar and they're watching a YouTube tutorial on doing bicep curls and they're all just doing it together. <laughs> so like, I think uh, across the board, you are sort of finding that these camps want the information. It's like, I think that's probably the best way to put it. They want the information. They just know they don't really have it. And so they'll stick with what they know. But, but I think to come back yeah. to kind of tie it together, to shun strength and conditioning because they don't do it in Thailand is kind of, yeah, just, just refuting the advantages that they would like to have. Yes. Yeah. yeah. I, I think that's exactly right. Yeah. It, it's um, uh, being open-minded is the thing, you know, and it's, that's, that's something I feel I bring something different to, to the way I train just because of my experience outside of Muay Thai as well. So, you know, the, the fact that I did American football, I had that influence. I saw that, saw the advantages of some of that stuff as an engineer planning and, and kind of structuring things and, and specifying what you're targeting and going for that and measuring it and tracking if you've done it or not and adjusting that all came from outside of Muay Thai. And, you know, I think that's, that's one of the strengths. And I think it's the same for everybody. They've all got influences outside of what they do. I mean, even, you know, strength and conditioning coaches, I look at some of them and some of them that literally all they've done is a strength and conditioning qualification. They, they almost a little bit channeled and blinkered again about what's right or wrong and haven't, are not open-minded about influences from anywhere else. And, you know, I even see like my, my daughter, she, she wants to be a, a professional dancer, classical ballet is her main thing, but I, I see some of the stuff they're doing, you know, and I'm kind of like, oh, okay, I can see how that could be applied as well. You know, it's, it's, there's lots of places you can borrow ideas from and it doesn't have to be this pure traditional sense of it came from here. Therefore it's the only right way to do it. It's there's so many different, um, different sports, different disciplines that have got a part of the puzzle really sorted out and we could just steal it. <laughs> it's done. Yeah. We can just borrow that in. It's just because it came from outside. doesn't make it 
wrong or bad or, or not appropriate for what we're doing. That's the magic is kind of spotting what is appropriate and pulling it in when it's needed. Yeah, that's exactly right. Like a lot of like, you know, the, the speed drills and like, um, how, uh, parax, uh, power progress I do, I, I take it from like, from like, uh, like <clears throat> that's a good thing about Instagram as well. Like, but like it's, it's like, you, you, get, you can feel all these different great straight coaches for me. And by a lot of them, like, you know, I'm just, I'm, you know, I'm just been following a lot of like, yeah, like uh, NFL, uh, strength and conditioning coaches. And that one, it's just like, this seemed that they had to be a little bit more spot on, like, you know, in terms of like foot speed and like, you know, and just reaction drills like that. I was just like, oh, just like, that looks good. I, don't know if, I think I can use something like that. Um, but like, yeah, going into like our listeners from them, we imagine they're pretty open-minded or we, we berate them into open-mindedness. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> but like, uh, um, let's, let's talk about some action, uh, actionable, like advice that we can give them. So let's just say we've got people listening, they go, okay, they'll, G'd up now. They go, okay, I think I can add this in. I haven't added any kind of like strength, uh, strength condition before. So let's just say something on a, on a weights program wise, just very general. And that one, like they might not have any access to a strength condition coach, which is always my first thing. It's like, if you, you got access to someone that's knowledgeable, go invest in yourself mm. and buy a coach or go to Don Heatrix's website and get some. <laughs> <laughs> as well. yeah, I do recommend that. But like, what, what's some, like just some, just some bare base advice that you can give someone that's like, okay, I want to start off, but like, yeah, I don't have the, the funds to kind of hire someone. Yeah. Yeah. Well the, well, the first thing is there is lots of free stuff on my website. Go and have a dig into that. There's, there's even a, a free body weight training program people can start playing around with, which is going to develop things really well. Um, and a, like a blueprint for putting all this together for a fight camp because it sort of it changes as you go through a fight camp as well. But as far as a, a training session goes, um, the main thing I, I have a structure because we're trying to do everything, but we can't train everything equally at once because it confuses your body and it just can't adapt to everything at once. So you need to kind of focus on specific things. Um, the the first thing I'd advise everyone to kind of focus on, I I use like a a concurrent or a conjugate method method here and it's where we are training everything but we focus on one or two things primarily and then it's like maintenance doses of everything else so we're not letting those spinning plates drop um so the first thing i'd say would be to to work on strength development but with an element of power and speed in there as well but i always start a session with um movement and mobility first so that's kind of like your warm-up but we're working on the precision of your movement and making sure everything's going right there a bit of the sort of soft tissue work foam rolling and things like that for the for the problem areas we have which will tend to be like that pec minor at the front get that loosened up get some rolling in there um thighs quite often and the hip flexors at the front there as well if taking low kicks as well that can sort of stiffen you up so at least kind of even just two things like that target those areas and then i'll move into what I refer to as like an activation and movement preparation. So that's where we're starting to move a bit more now, but we'll do movements that kind of warm up the patterns that we've got in the main session coming up. So I'll kind of, uh, depends that, that really does depend, but even if it's just simply something like, um, some body weight squats followed by some tuck jumps, for example, to kind of start springing things up. And then, then you'd go into, for me, um, the speed training part of the of the training. So this is the stuff that you don't want fatigued. So we're doing it straight after the warm up. You're 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 good to go. You're going to move at your quickest velocity, which is the key bit. If you're trying to develop speed, you don't want to be fatigued, and you you want to be moving the quickest you can with the least resistance resistance, which will be body weight. So that's where you'll be doing plyometrics and medicine ball throws and things like that. So you'll do a few sets of that, perhaps. You know the volumes of this you'd all switch around depending on what you're trying to achieve. After that, I'd go into power training. So I do like a, a, a tricep or a bicep. So two, two exercises back to back that don't compete with each other. Um, and that will be, this will be dependent on what your kind of skill level is with the lifts, really anything from like a, a basic, um, like squat jump, even just using a kettlebell held, you know, down, downstairs rather than anywhere else or, or a goblet squat style up in the front and just exploding and jumping up against resistance that that will be power development or kettlebell swings you know stuff like that or all the way to the other extreme if if you've um, you've developed it olympic lifting you know not essential there's there's other ways of getting that same characteristic but you know i i believe in gym skills as well and that, that keeps you kind of better coordinated and more mentally present as well rather than just doing the same old stuff so after that power tricep working through there with some mobility in there in rest periods i'll then go into strength to finish off so we kind of start fastest with the speed we get a heavier and a little bit slower with the power and then I'll finish with strength, which will be the slowest stuff. And the, 
the stuff that leads to the least coordination and sophistication as well. It's more just grunt. And that, that could be, I'll have a, a lower body exercise, an upper body push, an upper body pull, and a bit of core. And, and that's it. I'd cycle through those in like two pairs. Um, so lower body could be something like a deadlift or a squat because I like a, a knee dominant or a hip dominant action to kind of get all that balance up. Horizontal pushes and pulls um, or, or vertical pushes and pulls as well. So I'd, I kind of mix those up in the two sessions over the week. So we've got kind of fundamental movements that we're trying to hit. But that's basically the, the structure that I'd have in each session. That If you're doing that twice a week with uh, not on consecutive days, so there's enough recovery going on between one and the next for them to actually pay dividends and not to be fatiguing, then that's going to start moving you forwards. And it's, it's really then the game of which elements you focus most of the proportion of work on in those sessions. So we've got those sections in a workout of speed, um, power, and strength, and you're just dialing up or down the quantities and the, the overall volume work volume of those depending on where you are in a fight camp so um for a fight camp you're working from more general to specific so we get much more muay thai specific at one end and it wants to be as general as possible at the other end and that's that's one of the mistakes i see people make and they try and make everything as specific as they can all the time and it's kind of wasting it you know you kind of want to play your ace at the end and not play it too early when you don't need to um and also the other the other big benefit really of, of being general is that it's not loading your body in exactly the same way all the time and creating overuse injuries. So you're just making yourself more robust and then you can tolerate some really specific stuff along with all the other volume of Muay Thai training that you're doing that if you're kind of making it specific all the time, you're just going to blow something up. You know, you're going to have an injury. And that, um, I think you, you might just you, you might have seen this as well. Like you know, when you first started, you might have been resistance, like we talked about before. Like people not want to do it. Man, you, know, you might, might get to the opposite end of the spectrum. We see sometimes maybe just for the gram. I don't know. <laughs> people like you know they're, they're doing pads with like you know resistance bands around their arms and legs, or just shadowing with like with big dumbbells as well. What's your take on that? Yeah. So. I, I go by the sports science on this. I know it feels a certain way and I kind of look at what the, what the training effect is as well. And it's actually, if you're using um, resistance bands, it's it actually the velocity that you're moving at is, is one of those we're, we're always looking for dynamic correspondence is the term. So what in the training transfers to the, the movement you're trying to produce. And when you think about, so for example, a punch, when you throw a punch, it starts slow and it accelerates and gets quicker and quicker and quicker until it impacts the target. Mm -hmm. When you're stretching a band, it does the opposite. The band isn't stretched too far and there's a rate of, of uh, increase in resistance as it stretches. So you actually start fastest and you're slowest on the end. It depends on the, you know, the band you're using and all the rest of it. But generally as a, like a profile of how that movement works, it's the opposite of what you want to do. So I'm kind of not a big fan of doing too much of that. There are there are, if I always go back to what are you trying to achieve by using the band and people will say, I'm trying to be powerful and you're like, okay, well, there's better ways of producing power, you know, using, using the kind of methods I've spoken about with, with loaded jumping movements, if you don't want anything too sophisticated. And even if you, if you kind of look at the research for, um, punch force and the contribution of the different parts of the body. Um, I don't know if you've come across that that research before. It's quite an old one now. Um, Filimonov et al. I've got I've, I've got a link to it on my website actually. But he, he measured the difference between like novice um, boxers. These are just just simply looking at a punch, and um, masters of sport as they call it. So experienced pro fighters, and the difference in the the proportion that the different areas of the body contribute to a punch. And I can't remember the exact numbers now, but it was kind of like. Uh, an expert, the majority of the force was produced in the lower body for a punch with a hand. Yeah. The next was the core. And finally, it was the arm. And when you get a novice, it's completely the opposite way around. And it's more about they're using all arm and there's nothing coming from the body. So, and nothing coming from the legs and the ground reaction force coming up. So, you know, if you, if you wanted someone using effective mass, use punch, hitting with their body weight, you want them to focus on generating the force in the right way. And we can do that in the gym without confusing that. And if you're, if you're using a band going back again to that, it makes you focus on the limb, <laughs> which is the opposite. It makes you punch like an amateur. If that's what you, if you think of it like that, you know, you're going to focus on just straining that arm into it rather than too much generation from the floor. And there's, 
there's just better tools to achieve that. And I'm like, you know, 80, 20, it's like, if you're going to spend your 20% of your time doing something, we might as well do something that's going to transfer the biggest bang for your buck rather than just wasting time. You know, if you, if you want to punch, put a glove on and, and hit the pads, hit, yeah. hit the bag, you know, do that. If you, if you can get the benefit you want from training Muay Thai, do that. We want to do supplemental training that brings in something different and trying to sort of mimic the sport too directly is actually a big mistake. Yeah. Yeah. And, and a couple of things that I wanted to get your take on just, uh, just so we can get to it without, <laughs> I could keep you all day, but um, <laughs> I, I wanted to, to understand, I think it, it does come back to that because we get it a lot in, in Thai boxing, especially is just like we've spoken about just overall, just like reluctance to accept sort of strength and conditioning explain to kind of the listeners how because i think what's often misunderstood is that the, the problem with trainers is they say i don't want you over in the weights room because then you're going to be you know too sore to need the bag later on and too you know it's going to impede your ability to work on your skills so explain i guess <clears throat> how kind of the priority structure works between actually developing your skills and like we said, the supplemental training and how you work with someone. So when someone comes to you, sort of what you need to understand about what their current training routine looks like and what their skill work looks like and on various days before you start to work in these supplemental sessions. Yeah. So the, the first thing I'll do is I'm, I'm looking at what can we do that's missing, that's going to have that biggest effect. And it always is initially a couple of strength training sessions. When I say strength training, I mean resistance training. So it's, yeah. it's the speed, power and strength that I kind of outlined. If you're doing that, that's going to bring something that you're just not doing before. You're already doing quite a bit of cardio conditioning. There are things, again, we can, we can fine tune that and make that much more effective, especially at different stages of the fight camp. Um, but you're, you're probably already running. You're already getting the byproducts or metabolic conditioning work while you're doing your pads and you're sparring and that anyway. So I would just back off and say, well, that's all handled. We'll just do two strength and conditioning sessions or strength, strength training sessions. Yep. And that's, that's what I'd, I'd bring in. And it would be just a case of then picking where you are in the week. That's gonna, that's gonna work. And we're, we're looking for two days that aren't consecutive and we're going to ideally again, you know, I'd like to do those in the morning you know, as much as possible. It works for the model in Thailand as well. Um, and if you're training twice a day, I like to have like the resistance training in the morning, separate it by at least three to four hours, and then you can do whatever you want to in the evening. And that's, that's going to work for you. You know, you, the, there's not going to be significant fatigue that you're going to be feeling from that morning session into the later one with the exception as of if, if this is like a brand new training stimulus for you, because the first time you do anything different, it's going to make you sore. And that's, that's one of those things that, um, you know, even someone who's training a, a lot, if you get them to work against a resistance they're not familiar with or a range of motion that they're not familiar with or a, a quantity, a volume of, of movement that they're not familiar with, it creates DOMS initially for that first experience. Yeah. And then, and that can put them off straight away rather than persevering and going, that's a, like a, a one-off event because it was something completely novel to my body and it's made it sore. It's just, that's what happens. Um, and it's only then if you kind of misjudge your increments after that, there's that kind of rough 10% rule, then you, you don't make people sore again. You know, that's, and I'm judging a, a workout um, as being effective or not by being sore or not in resistance training is, is also not a good idea. You know, I kind of try and avoid it as much as possible, but um, to, to give you a bit of an idea here. So th this was something I went to the um, Yokao fight team and I was looking at, Sing Dam and, and Manichai and I was testing those guys for like uh well athletic uh, performance really just to see you know these guys are great in the ring but what physically are they like as athletes and one of the tests I got them to do was just for as an aerobic test was a shuttle run over 20 meters so as a maximum aerobic speed test a MAS test um just gave me an idea of the VO2 max and I could compare that on tables and just you know see exactly where that was but the uh the next day they were complaining about sore legs just because they weren't used to stopping and turning and shuttling back. So it was a five minute test. That's all it was. But they were like, Oh, legs sore. Can't kick, can't kick. And I was like, you're kidding. You know, I've got, I've got novices back here in the UK that could do this and would not be sore. And you train three hours, twice a day at least and have done for years. And this, and it was like, wow, I was not expecting that to make them sore. It was just because it was a novel, novel stimulus to them. 
that was a that was a real kind of wake up call. And I was thinking, and this is why the ties are like, this isn't for us, you know. Yeah. It makes us sore. I I've my trainer's gonna get me on the bag later now and I my legs are sore. And I I haven't been sore since I was like six years old or something when I first started training. I've forgotten all about how that feels. So you're introducing something that's minimal, but it's different. It makes them sore and they write it off right there and then you're like, come on, just persevere. Uh, the, the language barrier and all the rest of it you know but it's that's that's a really interesting one that one the delayed onset muscle soreness doms uh. <laughs> <laughs> but like yeah like you said any new stimulus is going to do that but like in people that just like want to like all advice I, I try and give people is like if you're going to do this or like it is, as you first start like we we don't want to take it to absolute failure or anything like you know you want to like what leave one or two reps in the tank you want good quality work especially speed work damn like don't don't treat it like a conditioning session and then like yeah. doing millions upon millions of like jumps or, or throws because it's, it's just yeah it just doesn't get the effect that you want to get but like it's like it's, yeah, it's sometimes just hard to get that through to like especially with fighters when they're just first starting because you know as, as we just said before because like, everything has to be hard you know we have to be like you know almost dead or puking between <laughs> every session to get the right effect but it's it but when it comes to this kind of stuff man, it's it's it really isn't no the fatigue's different you know it it's it's not all of the, with with the uh, the strength, power, and speed stuff. It's not going to be your heart rate that's the limiting factor and local muscular endurance. It's it's neuromuscular. It's it's a completely different stimulus. It's one that you it's a stealthy one. It just suddenly stops. You didn't even know it was going to conk out on you, and it does. Um, so it's kind of testing it in the right way. But that's another reason why it's so important because it's just it's an element of the training that tie boxers aren't hitting. Um, so if you can if you can boost that, take that slider and slide that up. It just crosses over so nicely, but it's it's so mis easily misunderstood, and it turns into another muscular endurance session, which is like everything else you're doing. So you might as well do Muay Thai if you're doing that. You know, at least you're getting your technical and tactical skill. You're wasting you're wasting time there. Exactly. One area also I was interested to get your thoughts on because, excuse me, what I have kind of read on your site a little bit is you've done some kind of broad guide stuff around weight cutting which i think is also i mean a lot of the time what i find is people do take like a more modern approach it's often weight cutting is sort of put in the same camp as the sort of general conditioning side of it as that kind of like supplementary so i guess because of just the the way that so often there is the 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 two two silos in in fighters is they have their technical training and that's how you just you learn to perform the actual sport and then you have sort of your strength and conditioning which often nutrition is lumped in with as well i know yes. as well that in muay thai it's very very similar as far as the mentality is concerned with weight cutting and with strength and conditioning in that people want to do it just the way they've seen it done in thailand and if you've seen them cut weight in thailand it's um not particularly scientific and it's pretty brutal they yeah. keep like uh, they will just not really give it. I mean, like, you know, it's not like as far as the energy balance is concerned, these guys burn about a million calories a day. So that's not something they always even have to consider that much, especially when like a lot of the time in, like we said, the foundational camps, it's not like they have tons of food to eat. So it's like, that's not something they have to consider the way a lot of Westerners do. Um, but it, what it is, they don't really think about it until a few days before the fight. And then probably like if you're fighting on Friday, Friday or Saturday, it's probably Monday or Tuesday that you first chuck, chuck the sauna suit on. And they're running around in the sauna suit for days, like for five days, they'll just be running in that sauna suit. But also they understand how much that depletes them. So then their trainers are telling, like, you know, I, I cut weight in Thailand this year under the complete guidance of, you know, the, the Thai camp because like yeah. there, there's no other choice, right? I've cut weight a lot and I know kind of how to do it and how it works for me. But what they'll do is they'll, they'll ask that you put on the sweatsuit or at the very least you start doing a, even more really long runnings. And then what they're going to tell you to do is um, eat more because you're, they understand that you're depleting yourself so much from all the work that you're doing and running on the treble and they want you to go away and put away rice. And like, it even gets to the point where they're going, eat that, you have to. And you're like, I seriously don't think this is a good idea. So like, I guess my question is like, how do you find um, 
the weight cutting you know when, when you start working with a fighter if you start discussing weight cut with them how do you find it's done most of the time is it done well or do people have a good idea of it or do you find that's quite similar to, to the strength conditioning is that there's still a little bit of i guess a, a bit of a lack of science applied to weight cutting yeah there, there is it's just again it's whatever they've been shown by yeah. their the coaches and, and all the rest of that gets handed down. But again, you know, like you pointed out, you know, science is a big help. If you actually pay attention, yeah. you can, you can stop wasting effort. And, um, I actually put, you say, sort of look to my website. I put together uh, a weight cutting guide. Um, yeah, it's awesome. thank you. Thank you. Uh, that one was really close to my heart because I put at the beginning of that, the reason why I put that out there really. And it, I waited some years before I did it as well. I, I interviewed, um, Jordan co. Um, Scottish fighter um, when he fought uh, the Z1 championships mm -hmm. and we we spoke about weight cutting he had a nutritionist he was doing it all properly and then you know if anyone knows about what happened to Jordan you know uh, I think it was like a year or two later he, he actually died making weight for a fight and he was he was basically he was found in his in his sweatsuit the side of the road had been running for days exactly as you've described you know in the suit and all the rest of it and it was just like Jordan knew how to do this properly, but you know, he wanted to please his Thai trainers. They didn't know really what they're doing. They just traditionally did what they did. He really did pay the ultimate price for it. And it's just, um, it, it's kind of important to me. I mean, the, the weight cutting bit, all the strength and conditioning bit, it can all be done better. And yeah. the, the bit with the wearing the, the sweatsuits, you know, it's just, you, you're looking to dehydrate. The, there's two bits to lose that water weight. That's what you're looking to do. It's the glycogen depletion. You're looking to run down the stored carbohydrate in the muscle, which stores water with it as well. If you run that down, you lose that weight. You then also got that. That's kind of done in that last week, just progressively. Yeah. And then you've also got going a bit dry and just being a bit dehydrated as well. So the dehydration bit is the bit people tend to just really try and max that out and don't do any really anything effective with the glycogen depletion which is easily half the half the weight dropped if you do that right but yeah. just take you need to know what you're doing a bit more yeah um but the dehydration bit is the real dangerous bit and it's the the reason that is dangerous is because as you dehydrate your body's core temperature goes up and when when that reaches reaches a critical bit heat stroke coma death all the rest of it and where that level is 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 so personal as well some people can go mentally dehydrated and be fine. I say fine, <laughs> they don't die. Yeah. But yeah. other Stay people alive. and <laughs> other other people, you know, as little as six, I think it's like just over six percent body weight dehydrated have died. You know, and it's just like, are you willing to gamble just to see where where you sit on that scale? Yeah. Because people do do die, and and it's the sweatsuit bit. The the dehydration should be the last part, right at the last minute. You're dehydrating, make weight, and then you rehydrate, restock yeah. your glycogen levels, get all your carbs and waters back on you. You're back up to where you were again. So the the kind of running in a sweatsuit like days before is you, you're looking to dehydrate them. Why are you dehydrating that many days out? You know, it doesn't, yeah. you're going to drink and you put it back on again. Uh, and all you're doing is running in a sauna suit that also increases exercising for one thing muscle activity makes your body core temperature go up you've got a sweatsuit on that makes your core temperature go up you're dehydrating that makes your core temperature go up you're just building a perfect storm to potentially end yourself so it's like you know you can do this far more sensibly if you actually just follow a nice structure play around with it see what works with you what works for you and um that's why i put that guide together on on the website it was it was one of those ones i didn't want it to look like Oh, you know, it's popular at the moment. It's yeah. it's kind of going doing the rounds that Jordan's died and Don's put this out. It's kind of like I, I've waited a long time before I put it out, but I was like, I need to put something out to stop people doing this. And just even if they don't fully follow it, it, it they just understand that okay, perhaps sauna suits aren't a good idea. And if they're being asked to do it, to at least be topping up more more drinks if the trainer's making them do it out in Thailand, you know, and just being aware of what the risks are. I'm just thinking. I'm actually doing this at the wrong time. I need to make sure that I'm running too dehydrated. Um, but yeah, it's that obviously when there's a fatal consequence, that's that's something I really want to make sure I'm I'm helping with if I can. Yeah, and what I liked so much about that guide, um, well, if, I, I liked a lot about it is that there's not actually a lot of scientific. There's a lot of 
a lot of hearsay and a lot of just arbitrary sort of information surrounding weight cutting, which is a big problem. But what I like about this guide is what I find a lot of the time when someone comes out and kind of publishes something that is designed to say, here's the safe way to cut weight. It's unrealistic is they just say, don't cut any weight at all. Just fight it. You walk around weight. And it's like, yep, yeah, look, I understand the sentiment. And if we could put the sport in a place where that was feasible, like, you know, we talk about one championship doing their hydration testing and stuff like that. It would be great if the sport got to a point where literally everyone was just matched in a way where you just show up every look fighters are healthy fighters are strong. It's not like, you know, if we could just fight where we're at, that'd be nice, but it's, a pipe dream essentially like i i don't know how we get to a place that what i like about your guide is it lets you cut what people might be considered it, it, it teaches you to cut a reasonable amount of weight or, or an amount of weight it's not like just saying just don't do it it's saying you know probably if you weigh 70 kilos don't go and fight at 58 kilos it's probably not a good idea but here's the weights that you know, based on the data that you've given me, you could fight at with some effort. And here's the the steps to get there. Like, I think that's so important because, and I've had this conversation with many fighters. At the end of the day, we've got to look at the sport and say fighters are cutting weight. They are. They are and they will continue to do it. So if the only information that they get is don't cut weight, it's, too, it's twofold. They'll just say, you don't get it. And they won't look yeah. at that and they'll keep doing it the way they've been doing it. Or they'll go, cool, no one else cut weight. And then I'll cut weight and then I'll be the biggest. So yeah. it's like, like, it's not like you're not going to get everyone to sign on to say, let's just all not cut any weight and fight it walking around weight. I, I just find for the most part, the the people that are saying, let's all not cut weight are the people that don't really understand that didn't have lengthy fight careers or, or aren't close to the sport. So yeah, that's what I really like about that guide is we need information that meets fighters where they are so you can't i believe say just don't cut any weight or just cut significantly less weight you've got to just make it a mate. look it comes back to the idea of a playbook that we talked about at, at the very start of the episode make it a plan just not like chuck the sweatsuit on and sweat out because mm. you mean like some people that look, you see this from ties a lot is once they know they have to lose some weight even weeks from the fight they start putting a sweatsuit on and i see that copied from fighters here they just start like then i've looked at i've had this argument many yeah. times like mate you're fighting in four weeks you don't lose more weight on your jogs because you sweat more immediately you do but then you just go yeah. man i'm thirsty and drink a gatorade yeah. and then it's just discomfort <laughs> for the sake of discomfort and maybe do you think it comes back to this idea that like actually this is my biggest problem with weight cutting i'm um, having been around a long time somewhere along the line brutal weight cuts became cool and I think it's yeah. like when you watch UFC countdown and you watch this guy clambering out of the, the, the salt bath and he's sunken in the face and he's going, oh, you know, way in tomorrow, only seven kilos to go. And like somewhere along the line, that became a little bit of that. That's the warrior thing is we just brutalize ourselves and, and we push ourselves to the, whereas like harder is not better necessarily. Look, a lot of elements of being a fighter, maybe you feel the same. A lot of it's hard. It's a hard thing to do. When did it become just a game of making it harder wherever possible? <laughs> you know what I yeah. mean? I think it's not cool. And like you, you mentioned the tragedy of Jordan Co. Mm. That's not cool. It's not cool to just get out. Man, it was 40 degrees yesterday, but I still put my sweatsuit on and I got rid of six kilos in one afternoon. Nice one, mate. That sucks to be you. Like, like I hate hearing these battle stories of weight cuts like I'm supposed to be impressed. Like, easier is better. You've done your hard work when you're cutting weight, right? Like, so why not make it easier? Yeah, it's it's struggle porn, isn't it? You know, it's like, yeah. oh, fight is tough. Therefore, make everything super hard. Therefore, that must be good for, for fight training. And it's, I mean, there is, like you mentioned it earlier, there's, there's this, the psychological side of it, mindset and being tough and and doing things you don't want to do and, and cracking on and finishing it anyway. But there's, you might as well do the things you should be doing and push it that hard rather than yeah. stuff you shouldn't be doing just for the sake of mindset and, and actually like negatively affecting your body just cause it's tough. No, it's wrong. Yeah. It's wrong. Got, yeah. got the wrong end of the stick. Too many David Gog Goggins audio <laughs> books happen to me. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> uh, so but it, it does come back to some things like there's a place for that. Like mm. I'm a big David Goggins yeah. fan. I like, but I want to think like that when I'm about to get on the pads because this is my time. Mm. I want to brutalize yes. pads for the rounds that I've got to do it. 
take that mentality to you to your look when i get underneath the bag that's when i want to be taking the gate david goggins frame of mind like i'm gonna need this bag as hard as i can 400 yeah. times and then put it up then it's like maybe when i get in the weight room and working with with Shane on something that's ultra specific. Now I don't have to be thinking about what's the way to make this as uncomfortable as possible. Yes. Just what objective am I trying to achieve and and what do I have to do to get there, right? Like mm. that's that's the big thing for me. It's 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 almost like back to that design brief. It's like what's the objective? What am I doing? How does that match the objective? Is it actually contributing to it or not? If it's not, I'm there's a line through it. We're not even doing it. I'm not nope. wasting time with that. You know, it's you should be able to go through everything you're doing in your training really and saying, right, why am I doing it? Why is it there? If if you can't justify it, cut it and either get yourself some rest time so you can apply yourself hundred percent to your other sessions without being so fatigued and get more out of that, or yep. replace it with something that you do need, you know, not just making something hard for the sake of it. Yeah, I think that's like the main biggest takeaway for today that everyone's listening. Mm. It's like, you know, you just got to be able to, like with your coach, of course, look at a program, mm. set it out like a paper. Like, you know, if you've got a fight coming up, you should be able to like, you know, each week break it down a little bit. But even like, even if you're just kind of general training, like you should still have like focus goals and just like, yeah, don't, don't make stuff harder than it needs to be. And just like, you know, do, just set yourself on the path that's going to get you to your, to your goals. Yeah. Yeah, but um, but look, like like always, when we like really talking with someone, we like to talk talk them heaps. But I think I think we're just like we're out of here, <laughs> which is good to say. Like Don, look, it's been really awesome talking to you. Love to get you on again sometime. Maybe if that's cool. Yeah, I'd love to love to come on. Yeah. Um. So, but for everyone that's listening, uh, where can they find you and and find all your all your information as well? The, the absolute best place would be just to go to heatrick.com. So that's my surname, um, H-E-A-T-R-I-C-K.com. You'll find everything on there. The, there's links off to the, all the uh, social media stuff as well that I share, but the, all, the, all the guides and bits and pieces and, and articles and videos are all linked from there and the podcasts and bits and pieces. It's, I basically just tried to build a big old resource there to, to let people kind of thumb through and pick out anything they, they feel is going to help them, whether it is weight cutting, whether it is the cardio conditioning side, um, the, the strength, power and speed side, or even the sort of the, the psychological side, the, the, the mindset side as well. There's, there's lots of anything to do with Muay Thai performance that I think will help. And that I get asked, I share it on there. So that's the hub to go to. And that really is a fantastic resource. If you listen to us a lot and you're not familiar with it, um, whether you're a fighter or you just train it or it's, it's a really, there's a lot of gold there. Oh, brilliant. Yeah. Thank you guys. I appreciate you. You kind of uh, give me some feedback on that because it, it's one of those things you try and steer you. You know, as a coach, what you think should be on there, but it's it's often when people ask you a question, you're like, "Is that is that something people are asking them?" That's yeah. that kind of seems obvious to me, but it, it's really useful to kind of you know, it's, it's that it's that curse of being of having knowledge in something, isn't it? You overlook a lot of things that people you're jumping too many steps. You need to kind of mention this bit to lead to this bit. So I've, with that website, I've I've filled in all the bits. So it, it's covered there somewhere. Nice. Cool. All right, guys. So you remember, we're on Instagram, we're on Facebook, we're on YouTube. You, if you're watching, press that fucking subscribe button subscribe. right now. Okay? Make it easy <laughs> so, for yourself. All right. <laughs> Other than that, um, John, uh, we're just going to play the intro and then like hang around for a little bit from there. Talk afterwards. All right, guys, everyone else, we'll catch you next time. See you. Laters.